enclave home now live in constant fear. Serial killer. The 600,000 men, women and children who call the city's poorest enclave home now live in constant fear. A faceless, nameless killer stalks their nighttime streets. Polly Nichols is not the first prostitute murdered in Whitechapel. Earlier that year, two other women meet an equally violent end. I think the main thing to remember about the Nichols murder is that the newspapers and the police suddenly thought, have we got a repeat killer on our hands here? And it was immediately associated with the previous murders of Emma Smith and Martha Tabram, which probably weren't related at all, but it was certainly in the press that there, there may be a maniac at large. So great is the fear that rewards are offered in the hopes that the killer can be apprehended. Ellen P. Walter and son of Spitalfields, a clothing manufacturer, writes to England's Home Office, asking them to offer a reward in exchange for information leading to the arrest of the murderer. Much to the public's dismay, the government summarily rejects the request. Rewards had in fact been offered by the Metropolitan Police and others at various times in the past, and the policy had been discontinued because it was felt the offering of rewards encouraged people to give false information in the hope of getting the reward. Down on the streets of the East End, Inspector Frederick Aberline of Scotland Yard and Inspector Edmund Reed of Whitechapel Division, along with their men, methodically search for the killer. While violence was commonplace in the East End, this type of murder was very unusual and the police were ill-equipped by experience or training to be able to deal with it. And uh, I think what they were up against was this well-organized uh, murderer who probably lived and worked locally and he had the knack of speedily removing himself from the crime scene and thereby avoiding capture and making good his escape. If you look at the Jack the Ripper um, cases, these were planned to a large degree. The offender brought a murder weapon with him. He didn't use a weapon of opportunity and no one ever recovered any murder weapons. Detectives on the case are in a race to catch their man before he kills again. And they are not the only ones hunting the killer. On September the 5th, the star identifies their prime suspect, a ne'er-do-well known as Leather Apron. A great scare began about somebody called Leather Apron. Leather Apron was supposed to threaten the local prostitutes and extort money from them at knife point, and a number of the prostitutes thought that this man may well have been the Ripper. The real point, of course, is that it was known that Leather Apron was Jewish, and it had nearly started anti-Semitic rioting with the suggestion that a Jew was committing these murders. Even as tensions grow hotter and the search for leather apron intensifies, the killer strikes again on September 8th, just before dawn. The victim is 47-year-old prostitute Annie Chapman. This was in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street, and of course there was severe mutilation. He totally opened the abdominal cavity. Her genitals were on her shoulder. He'd removed the womb and taken it away with him, cut her throat, and it was a very unpleasant sight. He has to mutilate the body, and when he does it in a repetitive, ritualistic way, he more or less leaves his signature, or his calling card. This time, the police have an eyewitness, Mrs. Long, a local resident. Mrs. Long, who identified Chapman as a woman she'd seen standing talking to a man at 29 Hanbury Street, described the man as a little taller than the woman, and Chapman was five feet tall. He looked foreign. We don't know why she thought he looked foreign. And she also heard him say to the woman, will you? And she replied, yes. And there's a further descriptive um, passage in the local press of the time, which didn't appear in the police reports, that he was wearing a long overcoat and a deerstalker hat. In addition to Mrs. Long's testimony, a leather apron is found lying in the rear yard at 29 Hanbury Street. Two days later, Sergeant William Thick of the Metropolitan Police arrests boots finisher John Pizer, a man reputed to be Leather Apron. The police fight through angry mobs as they lead Pizer into the station for questioning. Cries of murderer and Leather Apron fill the air. 
I think, to satisfy the public clamour that the leather apron should be arrested, the police apprehended John Pizer. At least they appeared to be doing something. Now, Pizer had a dodgy record. He had attacked a man with a knife the previous year, and he was charged with indecent assault on a prostitute shortly before the murders began. Under questioning, Pizer denies that he has ever been referred to as Leather Apron. Sergeant Thick contradicts his testimony, saying he has known him for 18 years and that he's definitely the man known by that name. Eventually, Pizer provides a credible alibi and is released. The Leather Apron found in the yard proves to be a red herring as well. It belongs to a nearby resident. Adding to Scotland Yard's frustration, several other suspects brought in and interrogated are cleared of suspicion. The serious historians recognize that, given the limitations of forensic science, which was effectively non-existent at the time, the police really did as good a job as one could reasonably expect. The police put detectives in disguise on the streets, just trying to look the part, wearing patches, walking sticks, anything to make them not look like a detective. In fact, the joke of the time was that whatever they dressed up in, they always kept their big policeman's boots on and gave themselves away. That's not the only factor, because, of course, uh, policemen on the whole are fairly big, robust men. So I think even putting plain clothes on them didn't disguise their, <laughs> their true <laughs> calling. The police tactics are evidence of the terror the killer has unleashed on the streets of Whitechapel. There is a public panic, and no attempt to track the killer seems too absurd. By September of 1888, dozens of additional detectives and policemen have been moved into the East End. They are joined by members of the newly formed Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, headed by businessman George Lusk. The police continue to haul in dozens of suspects from the East End. Inspector Aberline points to Joseph Eisenschmidt, a mad Swedish butcher, as the principal suspect. At the inquest for Annie Chapman, Coroner Wynne Baxter concludes the killer has surgical expertise, based upon the degree of the mutilations and the fact that Chapman's uterus is missing. The main theories thrown out at the time were that the Ripper might be a butcher or a doctor. This was because some of the medical men examining the bodies thought that he showed some anatomical knowledge. One of them thought he showed actual real skill. One should add immediately that others thought he showed no skill whatever. The butcher theory has some merit, I think, because especially uh, on account of the throat cutting. And that, for me, has resonance with the kind of skill used by a slaughterman. And in the case of the murder victims, it is likely that they were forced to the ground and then with a single slash of the knife, their throats were cut back to the bone. While speculation on the killer's identity continues, the man himself gets restless. He tries his hand as a writer in the first of two letters sent to the Central News Agency on September 27th. Dear boss, I keep hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly. Wouldn't you? Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The murderous fiend now has a name. The senior police at the time thought that the letters were the work of a journalist who wanted to keep the story going. Most serious scholars today are quite sure that these letters did not come from the murderer. But what a name he'd created, Jack the Ripper. <laughs> 